so much. I would like to thank the organizers and uh, uh, AIOC for this opportunity. I would be talking about uh, concepts in evolution, pre myopia, and uh, CCDDs. Now, as we all know, we came from marine life where visibility was very poor, light was very low. We had short range of vision. We needed more of olfaction and less of vision. Now, something happened. We came out on the terrestrial life, and then we became arboreal. More light, more long range, long range vision. So, with that, what we got ingrained is that the corneal power had to decrease. Lens, which was spherical, became elliptical, and the axial length had to increase by three times what we were used to in the marine life. When we came out, the axial length had to increase to give effect to long range vision. And that ingrained thing for the change in the axial length we still have, and this is what is probably causing more and more of myopia. So there is a, myopia is a global challenge. Incidence is, uh, and prevalence is rising uh, exponentially, as we all know. By 2050, almost half of the world population is uh, projected to be myopic. And prevalence of high myopia is also projected to rise very exponentially to about 10%, which is a major uh, uh, load on the blindness. And we are on the cusp of a myopia epidemic. Now, myopia leads to pre-myopia, and pre-myopia leads to emetropization. So what is, the IMI classifies pre-myopia as refractive state of point, uh, plus 0.75 to minus 0.5, and with other uh, risk factors like uh, sufficient uh, likelihood, which can give rise to future development of myopia, like close work, less outdoor activities, and if they are parents who are myopic. Now, when to intervene in these cases is an important uh, matter. Now, emetropization, as we were talking, that we came from the ocean. So this is a very important aspect. We have to understand that the visual signals relating to retinal defocus are, are there for both myopic and hyperopic. They regulate the eye growth. So identifying components of these pathways offers novel therapeutic opportunities. There is afferent arm, which is in the peripheral retina, which we use for DIMMs and all those uh, uh, devices. The efferent arm is poorly understood. Atropine affects eye growth through muscarinic, non-muscarinic uh, uh, actions, and retinal dopamine, retinoic acid, and nitric oxide are likely involved. So dopamine is a very important component in this with melatonin and dopamine, they are related, and pineal gland is also related to that extent, we can say. Now, dopamine is important neurotransmitter in the retina, modulates neurogenesis, visual signaling, and emetropization. Close relationship between light exposure and dopamine release. Inverse relationship between outdoor activities and myopia. Retina has high levels of dopamine, D1 and D2 receptors. They are D1 to D5 receptors. Retina has high levels of these. And atropine increments dopamine release. So if there is dopamine release, there is more atropine, and that probably controls the axial length. Now, how we approach pre-myopia? That uh, more outdoor activities, classroom lighting levels have to increase, and less near work, and parental myopia factor also has to be taken into account. AC by air ratio, axial length, and peripheral deep refraction are poor markers for pre myopia. Now, therapeutic options are you, uh, this is, there is a robust uh, experimental and clinical evidence regarding effect of dopamine uh, apomorphine on axial length of the eye. Uh, Atom 3 study is underway to look into this uh, pre myopia aspect with atropine 0.01%. And uh, devices employing myopic defocus are good, but they're not, uh, I mean, they might work in tandem with uh, atropine. Now, future questions vision holding, what is pre myopia? When to treat, age group, options, optimal dose, frequency and time of application, nightly or weekly, duration of treatment, up to what age? Potential rebound phenomena, age of when to stop therapy, and mode of action of these agents. Now, CCDDs, we all know in 20 years we have seen a lot of change in CCDDs as we understand them. And uh, that has happened mainly because of genetics and neuroimaging. There's a long list of CCDDs, as almost a dozen, and that list is expanding. Now, tubulins are very important when we think of CCDDs. These are uh, neurogenesis, neural migration, and neural differentiation are very crucial for CNS development. Microtubules are essential for these processes. 
So microtubules compose of tubulin proteins. These are like a cytoskeleton in the uh, cell. And tubulins are a multi-gene family and have been implicated in diverse neurologic conditions. Tub 3 and Tub 2 are related to, they're important to us because they cause CCDDs like CFEOM. Now there are certain CNS uh, problems we can have with Tub 3 and Tub 2 variants, like malformations of cortical development, degenerations of the corpus callosum, corticospinal tracts, basal ganglia, and hyperplasia of the oculomotor nerves. Could be microcephaly, microgyria, and polymicrogyria and vocal cord paralysis. So, a lot of systemic uh, involvement we should keep in mind when we are talking of these CCDDs. Other things are kinesins and trans uh, transcription factors. Kinesins contain three domains motor, stalk, and tail. The motor interacts with the microtubule tract and walks down the microtubule. The stalk links the motor and tail domain, and tail carries the cargo. So, they are very important for CNS. Uh, I mean, uh, transmission along the neuromuscular uh, nerves. Transcription factors are proteins involved in converting DNA to RNA. So imaging, as we know, has done a lot of uh, you know, knowledge has been gained through imaging. There's gradient echo and turbo spin echo techniques. One third of congenital uh, third nerve palsies may show hypoplasia. Up to 70% of the fourth nerve palsies can show CN4 hypoplasia or SO hypoplasia. DRS, uh, you have type 1 absent, 6 nerve type 2 present, and type 3 may be variable presence. Mobius, you have CN6 and uh, 7 nerve hypoplasia or abnormalities, and CFM, you have CN3 hypoplasia. Now, genetic studies, as we know in CFM, there is uh, KIF21A, which is uh, kinesin. And then there is uh, PHOX2A, which is a transcription factor, and TUB2 and TUB3 variants. So there are the three main groups of uh, uh, things which are causing these CFUMs. Pontine CCDDs, uh, genetics, as we all know, uh, DRS is very complex. You have CHN, and sulfur is in DRSs and Okihoro syndrome. FOXA1 has ABDS and BSS, and Robo3 is AGPPS. These are some cases uh, presenting in a very uh, complete, diverse way. I think I'll not be going into these uh, details. He had, like here, he was a third nerve palsy, and you could, there was a vestibule and nystagmus, as you can see, and there was synergistic divergence as he looks to the opposite side. When he looks up, So these look like third nerve palsies, but they have a lot of complex disinnervation. This is showing that the right eye is having intorsion, and when he looks up, the right eye goes for extorsion and the left eye goes for intorsion. What happens in a typical ocular tilt reaction? So these had uh, involvement of autolithic pathways along with third nerve palsy and vestibular nystagmus. This is another one showing fourth nerve and Brown syndrome, fourth nerve palsy and Brown's on the, in the same patient, one side fourth nerve and other side Brown's. So these are also both CCDDs, classed as CCDDs. Some of MEDs are also classed as CCDDs as TUB3 and TUB2 variants. So when we look at CCD, uh, MEDs, those with IR fibrosis need to be looked from CCDD point of view. This is another complex presentation with microphthalmos and uh, cystic eyeball and type 3 CFUM probably. So to conclude, I would just like to say what Socrates said, that I know that I don't know nothing. So we need to learn a lot about these conditions and their evolving entities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. In spite of your very busy schedule, uh, you have completed your, time, your topic in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I call Dr. Koker. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Uh, Mike, Dr. Doctor. Uh, Doctor Pandey, you said that Kokar. pre. Sorry. No, go ahead. Pre myopia means from plus zero point seven five to minus zero point five diopters. If a child has. Yeah. So suppose, then would you prescribe spectacles? Because in your next slide, you mentioned that these children are spectacle-free. 
So would you prescribe spectacles for these children or not? At that age group, they are they are not usually prescribed glasses because the, once they get older, right, they are about see pre myopia. We start treating by about five years to twelve years. So before that, there is emetropization which is going on till two years. Anyway, eye is growing. So from 16.8, we go to about 23 in axial length, what you were talking. So from two years to six years, anyway, there is process of emetropization. But so suppose, stabilized by that. Point yeah. 0.5, if you don't correct, it doesn't create much of a, it's not a, in a small child, minus point 0.5 is not a big deal. No, but if you have a child of say six, seven years or five years, who is symptomatic, who is having a headache, and he has this number only in one eye, will you prescribe? Uh, if it is in one eye, that case, uh, issues of an isometropy and all that, that needs to be looked at differently. But uh, classically, if it is bilateral situation, plus 0.75 to minus 0.5, usually it's better to postpone it and see how it is behaving. Because generally the parents are of the opinion that why do we need to give the child spectacles at this age? They are hesitant. So we should be aware of what we are supposed to do. I think that will go into the conditions of prescribing glasses, those guidelines for prescribing glasses. Yeah. But I think in this pre myopic situation. But he uh, is pre myopic. Yeah, yeah. Have you said about genetic cultural anomalies? Have you said some cases of Golden Heart Syndrome? Cases Golden Heart Syndrome? Golden Heart Syndrome. Golden Heart, yes, of course we have seen. Now, the thing is that. Uh, 80 to 85 percent cases are normal from the visual and the medical perspective. 10 to 15 percent of the cases, there are additional cranial anomalies. Again, the thing is that uh, the additional cranial anomalies, they say that it is because of the incomplete de uh, development of the first and second brachial arch to detect the genes, or maternal diabetes, gestational diabetes mellitus, or because of exposure to the rubella toxoplasmosis. And or intentional or unintentional intake of thalidomide, retinoic acid. I've said about four or five cases of Golden Heart Syndrome. I've published this case, and uh, most of them luckily were in the group of 80 to 85 percent of the cases were they were normal, which had a congenital lipodermatic disease skin tag, but the other anomalies that they are like, they have got the action of the anomalies in the form of double ureter process, congenital heart defects in the dental anomalies, hearing defects, then they have got uh, what is called as a fear of the mental faculty, sex alpha is normal, genital aplasia of the set, trigeminal anesthesia. There are 17 families of Golden Heart Syndrome in Greece. Yeah. Golden Heart Syndrome. Mithil et al. in 1968 reported three cases of optical bruises with. Yeah. Uh, sir, we have time for discussion at the end. So let's. Conditions, I think they have, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, presentation and uh, difference.